So what are we now right now? So right now, when it comes to the coda rules, we already worked with the claim committee or the advisory committee we worked on from chapter 3316 to chapter 3320. And we finalized this with the committee. It went to the managing committee, and now it is pending final city council approval. So this will be for the next code cycle. We recently, exactly a couple months ago, we came up with a technical cleanup amendment to rule 3319-01. And like I said, it became in effect exactly two months ago on July 23rd. And this, we came up with some requirements for the peer review and other items uh, that we found that it is very important to, to achieve. For VOB now built, we launched our system. We had two phases. Phase one was for the prototype and CD, and we launched that on April 27. And almost two months after, we launched phase two, which is for the CN. And the reason we broke down to do to two different launching dates is to get phase one was for the prototype and CD, like I mentioned. So we give the industry a chance to review the record. So we are not delaying the industry when we launch phase two when it comes to the on-site inspection. We made sure everything is accurate 100% because we did the data migration from boxes, from files, from paper, and we brought all of this to the system. For the uh, previously, we had reference standard for cranes, and this was from the 1968 code. We repealed this and replaced it by 3319-01, and we broke this to different phases. So phase one was about the prototype, which became an effect on January 1st of 2016. And that, that is mainly about adopting national and international standards to our rules. So we adopted some requirements or some standards for uh, such as mobile crane or tower cranes or derricks. So this is what we did for phase one. Phase two was about the on-site inspection when engineer is hired, which became an effect in 2017. When the engineer is hired by the equipment user and that engineer has to go to the site itself. So it is a site specific design and they have to look and survey that site and come up with a design and submit this to us. And this was mainly all about the design and this is phase two. Phase three and four are hopefully anticipated, hopefully in, two, in 2021. And then we also came up with a left director rule in 2017 as well, and it became an effect. And we, we did implement some local laws, such as a crane modernization bill. And we did that on, this would become an effect on January 1st of 2019. And the event logger, same thing, became in effect on January 1st of 2019. And then we also implemented the wind measurement, and this was prior to this. So the next few slides, I will speak uh, briefly about DOB now built, so you know exactly what we came up with recently. Uh, like I mentioned, phase one became in effect on April 27, and phase two was in July 7th. Uh, so mainly we came up with a digital system. We dig digitized the way that the business is conducted with the, with the unit itself. So now the professional engineer or the equipment user can go to the system and upload documents to us for review. And instead of coming to our offices and submit this in person. So now everything can be within a click of a button, behind a screen, somewhere outside building department. So we have the, the key stakeholders. We have the applicant of record. So these can be manufacturers for prototypes, engineers, and the word the engineers here are for the manufacturers, the engineers. Some of them are overseas. So a New York State professional engineer is not required. A license is not required for them. Device owners, when they register their CDs. And then we have the professional engineers that submit to us on-site inspection application. We have also some of the stakeholders are the inspector. We have special inspectors and we have progress, progress inspectors. And we have other stakeholders, 
file in RIP. HMO, this is something new. When the hoist machine operator has to go and be assigned, so the common user has to assign the hoist machine operator to a specific location, and the hoist machine operator has to go to the system and accept this. So it's a two, two, two layer acceptance. So we know exactly who is operating the crane where. So we know exactly who's sitting in that seat. Uh, master riggers, power crane rigger, lift director, same thing. They need to have an e filing account, equipment user, and any other licensees. So for when it comes to the access, there is public portal, which is limited, does not have uh, what the industry can see, but it tells the, the public about whether a permit was issued for that location or not. So they know exactly about the permit, the expiration date, and all of this. It's a quick summary about the application itself. And then there is an industry portal. That industry portal is for the industry members or the stakeholders to go and uh, and have access to an e-filing registration is required. So meaning they have to go and register for e-filing before they go and access our system. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about types of devices. So you know what we are dealing with in CMD. So we are handling power cranes, mobile cranes, crawler cranes, file drivers and derricks. And as a reminder, we also oversee other device types, such as mass climber, uh, CD5 applications or suspended scaffold applications, only the engineering portion of this. All of these applications are, are also reviewed in CND. So this slide here will show the two different type of tower cranes. So the, the, this picture here on the left shows uh, laughing jib. So clearly that jib laughs up and down. And this picture here on the right shows a hammer head. It looks exactly like a hammer. And this boom moves horizontally and the load moves along the boom itself. Okay. And here it shows a crawler crane at the Shea Stadium. And this is one of the biggest crawler crane in New York City. This is the 11,000, the LR 11,000. And there is also the 13 to 2050. And this was bigger than this was also Ali Bear Quay. And this picture here on the right shows a typical hydraulic crane. And you have the hour trigger here. So this here shows another crawler crane at the Yankee Stadium. And here is a derrick. And a derrick is a structure on top of a building meaning right away it does require reinforcement of the top floors, it can be three to four floors. So meaning requires like any other tower crane or even mobile cranes load impacts or load imposed on these buildings. So in order to support the derrick, you need to add additional reinforcement to the top floors. And that picture here was taken right after Sandy, a few months after when the crane on the left here was damaged on 57th Street. And in order to take that train down, and it took us almost six months, uh, the derrick had to be installed. So they had to do the reinforcement first, and then they were we were able to take down the tower crane. And then after that, uh, another tower crane was built to finish the job itself. Okay. And here the picture on the right shows a pile driver. So typically drives pilots. In the next few slides, I'm going to go throughout some safety hazards and how to mitigate that risk. So this here shows an unsafe operation. If you see in this picture, this is our crane. So that picture was taken by one of our inspectors. When a tower crane is installed, it cannot go to operation until that tower crane has to pass a load test. So you cannot cannot be used for operation until it, the load test is passed and the crane is signed off by the department. So when the, 
that crane was scheduled for an for an inspection by the by the department inspectors. When they arrived at the site, we found we found already or they found that they were already moving debris in that debris box. And not only this, they had uh, a gentleman in the debris box, like a cowboy. You know, no, no full protection, and this is also not allowed. And so de definitely we stopped at uh, site, we give a few violations, and we put a CCU's order on the machine. So they were using the crane without even passing the load test. Here is another crane, and that crane here, so the gentleman, yes, he has a safety line, or, or he's uh, tied off, I'm sorry, to, uh, uh, to, to the crane itself, but he's riding the block, which is also not allowed. You cannot ride the, uh, the block of the crane or the headed board. And you see here that the rule is clear. It, it, it says clearly written notification three days in advance need to be submitted to the department. So this has to be come to us as a, in the CN application. So the CN has to show if we are allowing hoisting personnel. So this is subjected also to the department approval. And in the application itself, you have also to show us a compliance with OSHA requirements as well. And here is a section of the rule itself. Uh, this picture here, this was on uh, Friday afternoon in downtown Brooklyn, when that site had uh, multiple approval for uh, several crane, uh, uh, different lifting capacity. And unfortunately, due, uh, due to shortcut, and despite that they had, they had an approval for a proper crane to do the job, they used the crane that was set up right there to lift uh, some kind of Edison bolt. So they ended up damaging the crane, as you see here. And it took us the weekend to uh, take this crane down, and a technician came in from the manufacturer to help during this recovery operation. And this was due to the overloading of the boom. Here is another example, and this happened last year at the FDR, when we see here that the bomb bro broke right here. And again, uh, the crane was overloaded. So, uh, and right after when this happened, the FDR was closed, and then we reopened the uh, FDR, and then we closed it again around between almost two to three o'clock in the morning for the recovery operation when we brought down the boom. And we also gave uh, several violations to the equipment user after that accident. Here is another uh, picture, and again shows uh, the crane when the lifted a load that was above the lifting capacity of the crane itself. So clearly here the rule itself it talks about the load, and it talks about that these loads has to be shown on the application, and it has to account for all loading condition, including winds. So the load that shows on the application cannot be exceeded. So you have to adhere and uh, comply with the maximum load that you can pick on a job site. This picture here shows two cranes on the site. They were very close to each other, which can cause also an accident. And we stopped this because we found no uh, plan on site to show both cranes. And if you look again at our rule, it tells you for the site condition, and this is a section of the rule itself. And if you look at the last bullet point here, other cranes or directs at, at the site, meaning clearly when an engineer submit an application to us, we have to show other cranes on site. We have to tell us how they are gonna avoid or make sure to prevent an accident from happening? Uh, will they have radio communication or will they have a signal person? What are they doing to prevent an accident from two cranes hitting each other? So that site was stopped and they had to amend the drawings and to tell us exactly how they're going to control this. Here is another picture shows the boom of the crane. And it shows the boom closer, very close to the pipe scaffold here. And clearly, anything goes wrong, that pipe scaffold would collapse. 
And the rule is very clear again, and it talks about minimum clearance of the boom or any other attachment of the counterweight. And again, this one here was not showing clearly on the drawing. And these uh, few pictures will show improper setup for some cranes. As you see here on the picture here, and this is a closer look to the picture itself, shows damage to the sidewalk. So, uh, and this is again improper setup because they did not have enough and sufficient damage to do this. So the bearing pressure exceeded the, uh, the level, level bearing pressure was exceeded and caused the sidewalk to crack. Here is another picture shows again, there is no damage here when we set up the crane on dirt inside the site. And here they tried to set up the crane right here first, pinch the hole, and then moved again the, uh, the crane somewhere to, to this area. And again, there is no damage underneath the outrigger. And the rule is very clear, talks about that section of the rule, talks about the engineers and inspection. So the engineer has to verify the setup. Anytime a crane is set or installed at a location, it has to be inspected prior to the operation of that crane, and it has to be done by the engineer of record. And uh, later on, I will talk ab about how that is documented uh, to the department and also on site. This picture here shows a, a loose bolt, as you can see it here. And the rule is clear. It talks about periodic inspection or daily inspection, and it talks clearly about loose bolts. That you have to look for loose bolts. You have to make sure you do not have loose bolts, or you have to retorque it when it is required. So you have, you have several kind of inspection that to to make sure you are preventing this from happening. And also, if you have a tower crane, so on the drawing itself, to the, about for the ties into the building, it, it 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 does specify exactly the frequency, how often that you need to retorque these bolts, and about the inspection requirements. So this picture here, when was taken, when the inspector showed up to the to the site, so that crane, the boom was damaged all over. As you see here, the boom itself was bent, the, lace, uh, the uh, lacing itself, and you see it all over the place. And we stopped this, so we issued a CCU's order and few violations. And here it's clearly the rule. It, it talks about the operator shall be responsible for the operation of a crane. So the operator was supposed to stop the operation immediately and report back uh, to the department. Yeah, this is something that we've been uh, seeing for a while, uh, you know, like when it comes to Christmas tree. And if you see here in the picture, and there are two loads on top of each other. So finally, we came, this was not codified until a couple months ago when we did the cleanup for the rule itself. And we added a section for the rule clearly to prohibit Christmas tree. So you cannot have two lo loads on top of each other. You know, like this is an accident waiting to happen. You can maybe unhooking one of the loads and you still have the other load suspended on top of the worker. And then all of a sudden you have the load falling down on the worker. We have to prevent this. So, and like I said, this became in effect a couple months ago in, in the rule itself. We've been always writing this as unsafe operation, but now we have a, a section in the rule to write it uh, clearly and to uh, Side that section in the room. So this picture here, and as you see, this this was a swing away jet. So what happened here in the process of swinging out 72 foot jet, a wrong pin was pulled out, causing the jet to fall down to the ground. So uh, even though swing away jet is exempted from the assembly and disassembly plans and does not require an assembly and disassembly director but the staff on site should be should know exactly not to wrong, not to pull out the wrong pin so they should be qualified and knowing what they are doing on site 
uh, assembly and disassembly plans are required for the uh, majority of crane installation or erection and dismantling, <coughs> uh, except when you add your own, when the crane is, is adding its own counterweight or when it comes to swing away jib, because it's, it should be very simple. It was not simple in this case. So the, uh, these pictures here uh, show some uh, broken wires or torn rope. And you see it here on the left side here and here. And the rule itself, there are many sections in the rule gives many criteria about when you need to remove the wire rope from service and the criteria of the inspection itself. And you see it here in the rule talking about the broken wire and the word broken is all over the rule itself. Like I said, there are several criteria. I'm not going to go through them. But, you know, like I said, this presentation will be posted so you can read it here, and it's in the rule as well. But you see, it's clearly tells uh, in that section in the uh, in the rule, all of the criteria when uh, broken wire or wire rope need to be uh, removed from service. <coughs> so this picture here shows a knuckle bone. So my question, is this legal? So as you see here, this is a knuckle bone. And during the installation of a column, so holding a column in place while the column is bolted, okay? So I will show you the code section that talks about this. And again, it is legal, another knuckle bone. And you see here, the beam, so the installing the beam. And again, the, the beam is on the hook while they are uh, connecting the beam as well. Another one, and this is actually a combination of all, everything is wrong in the picture. So the knuckle boom, again, holding another beam. And there, here is a homemade ladder clamp for the worker to stand on. So this is, everything was wrong in that picture. <coughs> And here is another picture that shows, uh, you see here, the load is suspended from the fork. This load is supposed to be on top of the fork, not be suspended from the fork with slings like this. So what is allowed for knuckle bolt? So the court clearly, chapter 3319, gives, allows the knuckle boom to be used exclusively for material delivery, as long as the total loom total boom length is not exceeding 135 feet on total boom length, and the height does not exceed 100 feet. And this was from the 2018 code, the 2014 code. Then when it came to the rule, we made changes to this, and we added as well that uh, when you exceed this, you need what you need to do in order to use the crane. So let's say I'm above the 100 feet, 135 feet in total boom length. Or I want to use a, that knuckle boom crane for construction. So I'm, I'm outside that exemption. And in this case, we came up with prototype requirements when we did in 2016. So we came up with all of the requirements. So, we, so now, you know, clearly a prototype, a CN, a CD, and a licensed operators are required when you use a knuckle bone for construction or when you exceed the exemption limitation. So as you see, the first bullet point talks about the delivery when it exceeds. The second one, you cannot hold steam in place. That's construction. That's no longer material delivery or loading and unloading. The second, you're holding the I-beam, like if you remember from the previous pictures, whether you holding a column or a beam on the hook, that's no, no right away. So, okay, so this becomes a construction. And same thing, you cannot use a knuckle boom for demolition. That's, this requires a CNCD prototype and require the license operator. So this picture here shows a mini crane and that mini crane was working 
on the 18th story building next door of that you see here, this was a garage next door. It was working on the 18th story building and it fell down through the roof here and just missed the car right here. Luckily, there was no fatality or injury here. Okay. So the department started to realize an increase of the use of many cranes for a while. And you know, there, there, is an, there was an exemption of the code that does not require them to file an application with CND when the boom length does not exceed 50 feet. Or, and also the lifting capacity is not, is less than three tons, equal to or less than three tons. So, and the industry has been using this for a while. So we told the industry you need to file this as an alto. We also came up with a mini crane roof in 2017. And we came, when we came up with a mini crane roof, we also came up with a service notice. So to tell them what you need to do. And also in the rule of the 2016, we said certain application need to be filed at the borough office as an alto alteration type two. So, so that alteration type two was from early 2016 and also in the 2017. And we told uh, the industry, if you're gonna use these, you need to go and file it in the borough office as a construction equipment type and a, prof and a licensed professional engineer, New York State licensed professional engineer is required to file these applications. And we gave some requirements. And like I said, all of this is on the service notice. Uh, the uh, machine make a model, the capacity of that machine, the, the capacity cannot exceed the three tons as a reminder. The site condition, location, uh, the wind radius, I'm sorry, the uh, maximum uh, radius for the crane itself, the uh, wind threshold, the minimum boom clearance. And as you see here, and definitely uh, where you're gonna pick the load from and the landing zones. And as you see here, securing tie back. So it tells you clearly the engineer has to show on the drawings how these cranes are secured into the building itself. So this would prevent an accident like what you saw the crane came down through the roof of the garage, this would prevent it from happening. So, and we also came up, allowed the manufacturer also in, in this mini crane rule, allow the manufacturer to have certain training programs and it had to be accepted by the department so they can train their operators. So uh, we looked at the training programs and we approved some of the manufacturers. And, and then they can give these training and issue these certificates. And we have access ourselves to that record so we can verify whether that, that uh, certificate is legit or not. And this certificate has to be specific to make a model of that mini crane. Can you use steel erection for a mini crane? Yes, you can, but there is a, a condition here. You cannot use these uh, crane manufacturer operator. You have to use a licensed HMO. So this is a must. So when you meet the other criteria of the boom length and the lifting capacity, you now we need an HMO. Okay, and uh, this would be for any many crane above one ton, okay? The rigging crew in this case, you all have to be trained as per the chapter 16 of the building code. And this is applicable to the supervisor and the workers also. So lift director is not required for a many crane, okay? So we do not require a lift director for many crane. So the, in the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about some of the on-site inspection. As I mentioned, when an engineer is hired for a specific location to design the site, that engineer is required to go survey the location, look at the condition of the site, uh, look at other entity that will be impacted by the crane location, 
uh, if this crane located within 200 feet of transit authority, any infrastructure for transit authority. And then in this case, they have to speak to the transit authority and they have to submit the Romans Transit Authority and give us their approval back to us, a letter of no impact. Do, uh, do uh, Am I putting some loads on a retaining wall or am I uh, tying the crane into the building itself and then I need the building engineer for the load imposed on the building itself? So that survey is extremely important. You, you, you take a look, you look also, do I have Kana Addison vault and any other vault? So and part of the application itself, and like I said, this now is submitted to us digitally, is they have to submit to us the plan, the assembly and disassembly plan. So it shows every component, how that component is lifted, and it shows the center of gravity, the weight of that component, and it uh, shows the pre-operational test pr procedure for mobile cranes. And like I said, load imposed, when action plan, and some calculation and certification from the engineer or any other entity. For the win action plan, I'm going to go uh, in details about win action plan in the next few slides. And also, I'm going to focus today on the updated CD8 forms, which became in effect since last year. Okay. And there are other requirements also, like I said, uh, for the on site inspection, whether it is assembly, assembly director, the lab director, a frequent inspection, and lock requirements. And then I will also talk about the local laws, like I mentioned earlier today. So, uh, when action plan. The when action plan, when an application comes to us, has to be accompanied by a win action plan. So, when action plan, and you need always to think about it, you have to differentiate between the in service and out of service. So, the in service when the crane is an operation, and the out of service is about how I, how I do secure this screen at the end of my shift or my day, when every time I need to secure this screen and put it in out of service. That's very important. So it gives clear understanding of the wind threshold. So do I can, can I leave the crane up in the air? Do I need to retract the boom? Do I need to put the crane in in a jackknife position? Do I need to lay down the crane? All of this is totally specified on the drawing itself, okay? And also, after I secured my crane, because the forecast anticipated certain wind speed, and I left for the day, and then I have a lo long weekend for a holiday, and then all of a sudden the forecast has a change, and now I have a higher wind forecast. What do I need to do? What is my protocol in the event of the forecast change? What do I need to do? What is the lift director responsibility? And how are we going to coordinate and bring the personnel back to the site to resecure the screen and put it in a different configuration or a different condition to sustain these ones? Okay. And cranes in New York City can be operated up to 30 miles per hour or the, the configuration maximum allowed wind uh, uh, operation that is defined by the manufacturer. The manufacturer can be more stringent than be for a specific configuration till you know, reduce it, or even reduce it because of the wind, you need to do some reduction. And I'm gonna show you this in the next slide. So that also has to be, a, that when action plan has to be a specific to a con a configuration. What is applicable to a crane model A is not applicable to crane model B. Even, even model A, it depends on the boom length, the laughing length, the uh, laughing jib. So all of this can make changes to the uh, wind limitation. And like I mentioned, emergency action plan. So if you look here and you look at the table on top, this is for the end service. And this table here was copied and pasted for my manufacturer manual. And as you see here, that for that specific crane that has laughing jib, that manual, it tells you clearly to reduce the load by 20% when the wind is at 25 miles per hour. And it tells you here 
to reduce it by 40% when the wind is at 30 miles per hour. So this table here is for the in service, okay? For the out of service, as you see here, the notes, okay, that shows the crane in this case, and based on that crane configuration, it tell you up to 49 miles per hour, you can park the crane, but it, it does clearly specify what you need to do. You need to do here in parentheses, upper in line with crawlers, with load blocks and weight balls and ground. Remember this, here it tells you leave it on the ground because one of the next slides, you're gonna see something different or secured, okay? And it tells you to what angle, very important, okay? To the boom angle or the laughing angle. And it tells you here above 80 or up to 80. So above this, up to 80, you need to jackknife it. And up, above that, you need, to, you need to lay it down. And look at the note here clearly. As a reminder, like I mentioned in the previous slide, New York City only limit the operation to 30 miles per hour. And as a reminder, this is coming from the manufacturer. You cannot operate above the 30 miles per hour. So, here is another uh, crane uh, configuration, and it tells you here when lit then 45 miles per hour, you can park the crane, you can leave the boom up, and it gives you the angle. Okay, it specifies the angle clearly. And it here tell you, tell you, remember the previous slide, it said to place it on the ground. Here it tells you do not place weight balls on ground. So it's very important to read these notes. And this was our... Uh, goal when we came up with the rule is to make the engineer have a complete package by incorporating this from the manual into the drawing itself. So the operator had two sources of looking at this information, this from the manual and from the drawing, okay? And here is another uh, requirement for the higher speed as well. So here you see, uh, for the out of service. And this is an example of a jackknife. And again, it tells you uh, the, the, the boom angle. It tells you the laughing jib angle here. It gives it to you clearly. And it tells you the maximum wind speed. And it gives you to, again about the block what you need to do. Sequencing of laying down, that's very important. The proper sequence has to be followed. And it's also showing on the drones, on the approved drones. It's a very important for the operator to follow this sequence. So to prevent an accident. Uh, back in 2016, uh, when uh, multiple compounded errors happened from the night before to the day of the accident that morning, and when they rushed and left the crane, and then all of a sudden they were taking down the crane, the main boom was lowered and instead of lowering the laughing jet. So it put the crane totally in unstable condition and the crane became uh, unstable and uh, flipped over, okay? So it's very important to follow the sequence on how you jackknife down uh, the crane. So I, need, I, need to lay down, uh, I need to bring the uh, laughing jet ferris down with a certain angle, and then I continue. So all of this have, all of these notes have to be followed. And here it shows the crane in a lay down position for the boom and jet. In order to lay down, you have to go to a jackknife position first, and then you continue and then you lay down the crane. So here in the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about tower cranes and action plans for tower cranes. So the uh, tower crane is, is a temporary structure. And the code itself defined temporary structure in chapter 16, in 16 ET. So temporary structure, and it, 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 all of this is governed in that section. So the code allows this screen as a temporary structure. It does require, the, it does allow this screen that they do not have to be designed for 98 miles per hour. We can use a reduction factor of 0.8. So which makes the crane is designed for 78 miles per hour or 0.85 that which is like 83 miles per hour. But you cannot be, go lower than the point. You can go above the point. You can go 0.9. So it depends on the engineer uh, what number do you, you want to lower the, the design. Uh, 
But if you're going to do this, code is very clear. If you're going to use reduction factors, you need to have an action. So your frame design has to come with an action plan. That action plan has to be implemented in very short period of time. It has to be reliable, reliably implemented in a very short notice. So in, in case of change of the forecast. So that action plan uh, will bring the crane, it has to bring the crane to the design of 98 miles per hour. So when it is implemented, the crane has to sustain 98 miles per hour. So uh, we also came in, in 2016 when we did the prototype, we did put a section in the rule itself to have a coordination between the crane design engineer and the manufacturer for this tower crane. So after the professional engineer visit, visit the site, we have to coordinate with the manufacturer. They give, you have to give the manufacturer the project address, the become model, which crane you're going to be using, the maximum lifting capacity, and the distance from the crane, the, the distance from the building, the distance of crane from building. When you give all of this and the wind exposure zone, am I working exposure A, B, C, or D? So when they give this to the manufacturer, they get back from the manufacturer some loads, some forces. So this is will help the engineer to design their foundation and their tiles. And the section here, this also we updated this couple of months ago. So these five, five uh, bullet points were updated exactly two months ago. We previously had three items, and we added two more items here. So uh, when this comes to us, and also remember when these forces also, when you design these ties, so these forces also are shared with the building engineer of record for the load imposed on the building itself as well. So that's a coordination and a team effort between the building engineer, the manufacturer, and the crane, in, crane design engineer. And here you see that we were talking about win action plan, and you see this crane win action plan can vary from one location to another. It happened previously that when you had when we had two tower cranes in very close proximity to each other, uh, the boom of the one of the tower cranes was taken down by the second tower crane, and we also removed a couple of the counterweight. But in this case here, that's shown on the drawing here, we had to release one of the tiles. Okay, sometimes they lower the climbing frame. Okay, so it can be different scenarios. And like I said, that's a team effort between the crane design engineer and the crane manufacturer. Crane manufacturer has to bless this. So I'm going to here in the next few slides talk about the CD8 forms that became in effect uh, last year. So we previously we used to use uh, PR forms from the borough offices, but we found out that we need to use our own forms because it is more applicable to, to the crane itself. So we came up with our forms. And do we need, why do we need forms? So first thing, we need consistency reporting back to us. It's a very, it, is, it, it gives us the same exact means and method of reporting back to us. We have the consistency across the board and with the required items. So it, Definitely improves the reporting back of the special inspection. So we have three forms now. We previously, we had until last year, we only had the CD8 form, which is required by the file. It is filed by the design applicant of record, which in this case is a crane engineer. So we updated that form to capture more of the requirements from the rule itself. And then we came up, like I said, with two new forms CD8 TR and CD8 AD, Assembly Disassembly Director. So the CD8 TR, it's a joint effort between the design engineer and a special, and a special inspection agency. So, and the CD8 AD, so we retired previously, we had the, the plum and torque report, or plum and torque form, which was CD6, was incorporated into that form, and we retired the CD6 form. And now the surveyor, in case of a tower crane, or the load test and everything has to be documented on the CD8 ED4. So it has to be filled out by the master rigger or tower crane rigger when applicable, meaning when there's a tower crane 
all other devices can be done by assembly and disassembly directly. Okay, CD8 form is always required. 100% of time, always required. So, always the engineer for the crane has to fill out the form. And if you remember, I did speak about the uh, build for cranes, a new system. So that form for all application that filed in build has to be uploaded to the system in order to allow the crane to be used on, on, on that site. Okay, so and also has a, a copy has to be kept on site as well. So the engineer is the gate keeper for all forms is the one who has to look at has to fill out the CD8 form, has to review CD8 TR and AD, and he is the one that is required to submit to us all of these forms by uploading these forms to the system. Okay, CD8 TR form uh, always will require, not, not every case scenario will require special inspection, so but when it is required and it is part of plan examination, and then it has to be submitted to us. And the AD, only there are two exemptions, like I mentioned previously, when one is the swing away jet, and when one when you do uh, your, uh, when the crane is adding its own counter. And in that case, the CD8 AD is not required. So, um, you know, like I mentioned CD8 form, and exclusively it has to be filled out by the design applicant. And there is a checklist that we added to all of these forms, and we added all of the rule reference to these forms. Okay, I mentioned that we replaced TR form. Every phase required new submission of these forms. So if I'm jumping the crane and I have a new phase, I added a few mass section. I need new forms, all three forms. Um, if I uh, move the crane from one location to another, I have a different phase. I need forms again to be also uploaded to the system. And the engineer identify the requirements when the application is submitted for plan examination. And we also, we, we also identify the inspection agency when they sign up on their section. Okay, so uh, this drawing here or this plan shows uh, power crane foundation and it shows some requirements on the CD8 TR4. And in this case, the subgrade and the B foundation and the reinforcement for the foundation and the concrete, all of this is subjected to special inspection. Okay. I mentioned this already. So now here, who will inspect these? And we are, uh, we have few uh, more minutes, so I'm going to go over them a uh, few slides quickly. So who will inspect these? As you see here, I have a tower crane tied into the building. I have the connection here to the building. So this is right away. That connection here is subjected to special inspection. So special inspection agency has to sign up on this. Okay. Who does this connection here with connecting the collar to the tie? That's the master rigger or tower crane rigger. Here, you see it here. So this is the master rigger or tower crane rigger. This beam here or the tie into the building. So there are two scenarios that Tie can come in from the manufacturer, which we do not see this more often. Usually it's coming from a steel fabricator, from approved steel fabricator. So when it comes from a steel, approved steel fabricator, only the engineer, uh, the crane engineer has to look to make sure that it's not damaged and all of this, so they sign off on it. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about uh, some local laws. So the first one is the event recorder which became an effect on January 1st of last year, and which uh, it became across the board for all cranes that when they renew them or new crane that submitted to us. And as at minimum, these event recorder, when these are submitted to us, it has to account for an test capture, crane configuration, any overload condition, the status of limits switches, and whether the operator did override the crane or not is very important for us. And this also can be always required by the department 
at any time, and it has to be available to us upon request. So uh, there are some ex exception to this local law. So if the crane itself cannot be retrofitted to have an event recorder installed, so let's say I have an older crane model, and it can cannot be retrofitted, and the manufacturer certified to us that crane cannot be retrofitted. This is when there is the exemption and they do not have to install the event recorder. The crane age bill, which limits uh, a crane age to 25 years in New York City. So this also became an effect of, uh, on January 1st of last year, and this is ongoing. Every time a crane makes it to the retirement age, cannot you cannot be used anymore in New York City. So uh, very important for the uh, for that uh, local law. It did redefine the manufacturer date, and it said that it is the earliest the date of the crane itself was originally manufactured, or the date of the oldest major component of the crane was originally manufactured. So this what would govern the the, uh, the crane age itself. And it says, and it also sets standard for the maximum duration of a crane. Okay, so uh, a crane, if the crane is still working on site and it does make it to 25 years, so that's then one of the exceptions that allow the crane to finish the job first before it expires, and then it expires immediately when the crane is removed from site. So uh, this is the uh, last local law uh, bill that I'm going to talk about, which requires. Uh, I mean, a method to measure wind speed. So it is very important. All of this has to be installed and used during crane or derrick operation. So the anemometer must be provided by the crane manufacturer or its approved entity. It has to be installed at the top of the boom or any other location, but it has to be specified by the crane manufacturer. It has to measure three, three second gust wind. And it has to be always available to the HMO so they know what the wind speed is in real time. So it's, you know, exactly not to exceed the allowable wind speed for that crane. So I'm almost finishing. So, um, and it has, when it comes to a derrick, it can be installed on the derrick or, or the highest point of the building itself. And these are some also of the these bullet points are some of the requirements as well. So, like I said, it has to be here must be located at the site highest point uh, for the derrick itself, and it has to be freely uh, and exposed to wind. Must be freely exposed to wind, so it can measure the wind. It has to be calibrated and according to ASTM. I mentioned about the three uh, second gust wind, and I mentioned about it always has to be. This is like a quick summary about what I mentioned previously. It has to be available always to the operator. With that said, this will conclude uh, my presentation for today, and I will be taking some questions right now. Just give me one second so I can read this question. So one question here, can crane left over an open sidewalk if it is protected with sidewalk shed or must be sidewalk be closed? Definitely the second, this is when you have your black person. You cannot allow the public to go under that load when it is lifted. So the two black person have to stop people from going below the sidewalk or underneath the sidewalk when you are bringing the load on top of the sidewalk until when the load is cleared from the top of the sidewalk, when you reopen again the sidewalk underneath and you allow again public to, 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 to pass by. Any other question? So service, okay, the, uh, another question is about where could we find the service notice for filing a mini crane? 
all of this is on our website. So there is a page for Crane. Our web page has all requirements. And please get familiar with that page. It tells you many of our requirements. It, it, we have our service notices for uh, our rules. And uh, you have a link to everything there, a link to build. So it's very useful uh, for you to, to have access to that uh, web page. So get familiar with it, this page. Another question, are architects allowed to file any of these application or conduct any of these inspection? So uh, clearly the code requires a New York State professional engineer to submit an application to us, and it has to be New York State professional engineer. So the rule clearly specifies this. And for the inspection, that this is this is subject to special inspection agency requirement. So they have to meet uh, these criteria. So there's another question about what do you need if a mini crane has a two ton capacity? So it is very important as well to look also at the boom length. So the boom length has to meet the criteria as well. It cannot exceed the 50 feet in total boom length. So in this case, that application has to be filed at the borough office as an alteration type two, and it has to be accompanied with the engineer. They have to hire a New York State professional engineer. He, he has that, that engineer, he, he or she has to submit the application with all uh, the requirements in our service notes. So there's another question. But it's not actually clear here. Okay, so there is a question about will you be discussing the different log requirements on the different types of crane? Uh, I would love to, but there is a time uh, restraints, so that's why I could not cover all of this. That's why I highlighted the sections uh, from today's presentation to cover. Uh, and as I mentioned, if you go to our web page, you will, and if you go to the rules section, 3319-01, you will have all of these requirements here. Okay. Another question. What forms is filled out when a mobile crane is moved to a new location approved on the CDA? Okay, so uh, this depends on the application itself. And like, as I mentioned, it varies from one application to another. Do, do I have any other requirement that makes a special, in, a special inspection required? So it depends. So always the CD8 is required by the engineer. And then if there are other forms are required, do I, do I need to uh, disassemble the crane and reassemble the crane? And in this case, I need to, use, to have my CD8 assembly and disassembly forms. So like I said, it varies from one location to another. So usually you need to speak to your engineers to know exactly what, what is required when you move it from one location to another. And so uh, this will uh, conclude our today presentation. We will uh, take the other questions. So we have we are already going to read these other questions, and we're going to answer these and post it on our website with the presentation shortly within two weeks. All right. Thank you.